Reap. In time we shall reap. In time. In time we shall reap. Um, it's my unique pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, Tom Woodward is the Assistant Director of Instructional Technology for Henrico County. Um, he works in K-12 currently, but he has also worked in higher ed, um, amongst other things. And I actually had the pleasure to work with Tom on my sabbatical from UMW for six weeks. Uh, with Tom, actually, as an instructional technologist at the University of Richmond. And that was an amazing experience because I followed Tom online at Bionic Teaching for a while, probably for a year or two before I met him. And when I actually finally met him, we hit it off and we became kindred spirits. And one of the things that happened when I was ready to leave Richmond is Tom Warbird probably used one of the most creative kind of examples of Twitter I've seen yet. He created a Twitter account called Jim Quits because I was quitting Richmond. And he followed me and taunted me regularly through Twitter to the point where people who were in my network who didn't know Tom Woodward would email me and say, are you all right? Is this person abusing you? And um, that's a good introduction for what you might expect from this presentation. But to go on, Tom Woodward is also an unbelievably creative and imaginative guy. We've done presentations together entirely in Russian accents. His Russian accent was much better than mine. We've done presentations in Second Life where we turned the audience into zombies and set them on fire with flamethrowers, which was quite fun. But what I think I'm so excited to have Tom Woodward here today is that Tom Woodward may very well be the most creative and imaginative figure working in instructional technology today. Every time he does something, whether it's through an image, a blog post, an animated GIF, a thought, he is doing it in a creative way, but also a highly critical and deeply thoughtful way. And with that, I introduce Tom Woodward today, and it's my great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I got a lapel. Well, after that introduction, uh, the bar is set kind of high, isn't it? So. Uh, so I figured we'd start with a disclaimer, right? <laughs> Which is always a good sign. I, I initially asked uh, a few people in Henrico County that uh, as long as I preface this with these are my own thoughts and opinions, et cetera, et cetera, I can't get in any trouble for anything I say, right? And I was told that wasn't the case. So <laughs> I think that's kind of awesome. So we'll, we'll, see, how this, we'll see how this goes. Um, now, there's a couple of things that are kind of interesting about this presentation. I did a couple versions of it, you know, one with kind of a biblical theme with kind of plague woodcut engravings, and that was kind of more along the line of the original title. Um, and then I did another one using just people's tattoos as the images, right? So, and then yesterday, I just was kind of frustrated with both those versions, and so I asked Twitter, just random people, who apparently uh, honored my request for masochism, and they just sent me images. So uh, the majority of images you'll see in this presentation are just randomly submitted by uh, all sorts of people across you know, the US, Canada. I don't think we had anyone international. But it's just kind of a fun element that added uh, at least one, one chaotic element to this that, that I thought was you know, worth doing and, and kind of fun. So. Now, Jim's introduced me, and you can see, uh, you know, he, he named some of the reasons why I'm here talking to you. But uh, because of my career path, which has been uh, highly erratic, uh, I feel like I'm kind of in an interesting place to talk about how K-12 impacts higher ed. Bless you. So, um, you know, I've been a teacher, a sixth grade teacher, uh, at a failing SOL school, so I've seen that side of things. What happens when people say you're not passing these standardized tests and the kind of regimen and structures that are put in place to make sure that your students are going to pass these fill-in-the-bubble tests. Now, at the same time, uh, I've worked for about 10 years, uh, you know, off and on at the University of Richmond. Uh, a large part of that time tutoring uh, students in English and, you know, basically papers. Um, so I've seen over 10 years kind of what's happened with writing uh, for, for first year students and, and what they expect and what they're used to. And that's been kind of an interesting thing to see. Uh, at the same time, 
Um, I teach uh, in the graduate school program, the teacher licensure program for the School of Continuing Studies. So I'm working with um, people who've been out of school for a variety of amounts of time who've decided to go back and become teachers. So, so I'm getting some of the older student perspective as well. Um, personally, I've got four children. Um, two of my boys are in Montessori school right now, and it's been really interesting to see how even in a school that's supposed to be devoted to almost the opposite of standardized testing, how much societal pressure has been come to bear even in this sort of environment. So we have so many. Did I lose it? There we go. And focusing towards that, in the community in general, it's impacting everything. So it's not just a public education issue. It's, it's, it's much bigger than that. It's a, it's a, it's a large societal change. Uh, I've also worked at a boys and girls club, so I've seen what even non-for-profits are aligning themselves to state standards because it helps you get grants in all sorts of ways. So these decisions that are being made in K-12 are impacting a much broader spectrum of our society. Um, and, and I think in a negative way. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to make that argument here. And we'll see whether you all agree with me. Um, so, you know, we're a small enough group that if you have questions or, or comments as we go along, you know, shout them out. Or uh, I believe uh, Tim offered to monitor the Twitter stream for me and put things forward if you'd rather do it that way. Um, so let's kind of take a look at where we are right now. Well, we'll look at the past first, right? So this, to me, kind of exemplifies what, what education used to be perceived as, you know? It was that cute puppy dog that could do no harm, right? Even if this dog ate your shoes, you wouldn't blame the dog. And, you know, that's kind of the way I, I see it going back a few years. And, and things have changed pretty considerably in the way we perceive education right now. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit more like this. Um, you know, K-12 is seen as this horrible place. Our test scores don't match on national standards. You know, you see Waiting for Superman where they're saying, you know, all these things about teachers union essentially, you know, destroying lives. Um, and, and we have this, this kind of Pied Piper uh, group out there uh, leading us on this merry dance. And, and a couple of the people involved in that, I, I think it's kind of interesting to look at. Um, you know, so we've got Oprah, Bill Gates, Michelle Rhee, and uh, Ken Kay. How many of y'all know who these, all four of these people are? All right, so a smattering. So I'll go ahead and introduce a few. So I think we know Oprah and we know Bill Gates. Uh, Michelle Rhee was uh, in charge of schools up in D.C. recently. She made a name for herself, you know, being really anti-union and firing all sorts of people and, and being pretty strong. And, um, you know, she was just kind of the, the hit man who came in there to supposedly straighten up the school system. Um, and then you got Ken Kay, who was the president of the Partnership for 21st Century Skills which is a group really of businesses that say, you know, these are the kind of skills we want in our future employees. Um, really business heavy group, um, but a group that has a huge influence on K-12 education in terms of setting standards and uh, is certainly a group that is widely adopted in a, in a number of states that have to do X, Y, and Z in order to get this P-21 certification. So this group of uh, of people is shaping a great deal of what's going on in the educational landscape. Uh, kind of scary thing here is I couldn't really find much about him, but uh, among the other people, um, Oprah is really the only one with a lot of experience with public education. And teaching-wise, Michelle Rhee taught for three years, and that's that. So we have a group of people, you know, and there, there are others, there are lots of others who, who have no experience with education even as participants, let alone practitioners, who are doing quite a bit to shape what happens. Bill Gates, I don't know if you all saw it, but uh, with Core Curriculum and Pearson, they're setting up this free online curriculum. So we have a company and Bill Gates, you know, with their own motivations, essentially working to establish this free online curriculum that will be very influential to a lot of schools. Uh, all very scary things, in my opinion, um, by people with, you know, kind of mixed motives. Um, 
And because of uh, Common Core and a variety of other things, uh, business is kind of looking at K-12, public K-12, like it's not even fish in a barrel, right? You're a dead fish washed up on shore. You know, you are a carcass ready to be picked clean. Common Core is going to enable them to make one product that would go across the country. You know, Virginia is one of the, you know, select group of people who, who are states that haven't adopted Common Core. And, but once, you know, you figure where the money goes, uh, compliance will follow. And we end up in a situation where people can make huge amounts of money because they can make one product that will go in all school systems. No more of this need to pitch things independently. Um, and if you hear Arnie Duncan and some people like that, they talk about Common Core as an enabler for business to kind of come in and take over and an incentive for them to do so which to me is, is kind of a frightening and questionable goal. Um, and, and I think what, what you'll see driving this a lot of times is, is the kind of the twin menaces, right? So we have the China, India, we're not going to be competitive globally argument, you know, represented by our uh, poorly written uh, electricity sign, and this idea of digital natives and the fact that we're getting students who are, are different than what we're prepared for. And I think uh, Mike Wesh's kind of comments are interesting in that what, what I see, and I'm curious about y'all, is when I have you know, students come in, they're digital natives in the fact that they expect certain things, but they're not digital natives, and it seems like he's of similar mind in that they can do lots of things with the technology. So you might be able to get on Facebook, and you might expect to be able to communicate instantaneously, but you know, when it comes to say, you know, something even as simple as Excel, a lot of these students are lost. They can't harness it, they can't create information, you know, graphics that demonstrate their point. They can't do these higher order skills. You know, and, and honestly, I have contempt for Facebook for the most part, because I mean it's made so like you know, pretty much a monkey could use it, right? It's not a great you know, leap of skill to be able to click like. You know, to be able to understand how to harness it and use it effectively, that's a, that's a whole other level of things. But these kids, these digital natives, people have kind of decided we can skip teaching them how to use technology and how to apply it because they are, they're born knowing this stuff. And I, I'd argue that that's not the case at all. So we're in a situation where, where corporations are ready to storm in with charters and you know, just a huge number of expensive fixes for what ails education, right? So if you're failing the SOLs or whatever your standard is for your state, we've got the solution, a very expensive solution that you'll pay us lots of money for. And a lot of times what they are is just old content and new wrappers, right? Just like this guy, you know, it's, it's really incongruous. It's uh, multiple choice tests that now, and when you click the right answer, a lizard jumps up and says, hooray, you know, but it's still just a miserable multiple choice test. And, you know, they're just not, they're not rethinking how things are done, they're just doing them with new stuff. And I find that inherently distasteful. But it's really easy for people to kind of get suckered in by the glitz and gloss over the service and not really delve down and say, pedagogically, what is this enabled? Um, and you also end up with some really unpleasant combinations, right, of things that you really don't want. Um, and at its core, and I speak to this from, from direct experience, so I taught in an alternative middle school, uh, basically the kind of place where kids went before they were kind of kicked out of the school system for good in a lot of cases. A lot of my students were, you know, um, had committed various kinds of crimes. <laughs> Not all of them felonies. Um, <laughs> but they, they'd been in trouble and they'd really, really ended up in a place, you know, that was supposed to be different for them. But it wasn't so much because the focus was still on these standardized tests. And those standardized tests really directly influence how you expend resources. So this seemed to be the best way I could take it. We'll pretend each one of those cups counts as a student, so you got six, 20, and five of the various capacities. And we'll just say that a combination of knowledge and skill is what you see in those liquids, 
right? And you have that amount of energy in the pitcher. Uh, 